Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity. I want to thank you for convening this hearing and thank our witnesses who are seated before us and obviously the other members of this committee who feel very, very deeply about this issue. I think it's fair to say for all of us that Americans deserve nothing short than top-tier, customer-focused, accessible, and efficient services from their government. Today we convene to discuss a topic that impacts veterans, it impacts grandparents, and all of those who rely on our federal agencies as a lifeline, and there are quite a few people who rely in that, that way. And so we owe it to our constituents and to the American public to keep our commitment to improving government work for the people. Uh, and when discussing agency backlogs, I think it's pretty important to take note of the timeline leading up to our current crises. In 2017, the previous administration implemented a nearly three-month government-wide hiring freeze. Some agencies maintained that their hiring freeze was substantially longer, such as the State Department, where the freeze lasted for 16 months. The freeze constricted, as we all know, the job market and destroyed employee uh, morale and employee welfare in many respects. However, since then, we, I think, have been playing a game of catch-up and most agencies have struggled to hire enough staff, even in the midst of record low unemployment. The American Federation of Government Employees reports that in fiscal year 2022, the Social Security Administration's workforce was one of the smallest, one of the smallest it's been in 25 years. And yet, we know that the number of people on Social Security, people who rely on those benefits to pay for food and to pay for medicine has increased by more than 10 million people in the past decade. This increase in beneficiaries and the lack of staff has extended wait times to where they unfortunately and regrettably are today. The Social Security Administration is headquartered in my district in Baltimore County and for example in the state of Maryland processing times for disability claims increased by roughly 105%, and that's in the period from 2019 to 2022, further extending processing times from 106 days to 218 days. The issues of low staffing and long processing times are shared across almost all customer service focused federal agencies, and I'm sure all of you can attest to that. The passport demand is still at record high, putting significant stress on the agency. Last month, Secretary Blinken testified before the Congress, uh, specifically the Appropriations Committee of the House, noting that the State Department is getting 500,000 applications a week for passports, and noting that that is 30 to 40 percent higher than it was last year. So these are really alarming statistics, no matter how we look at them, when it gets back to whether or not we're delivering, uh, delivering the kind of customer service that we should be. Uh, demand is skyrocketing, and yet staffing and resources remain static. And the most vulnerable communities are the ones that usually are disproportionately affected by these types of issues. If we look at our veterans, a stifling backlog at the National Archives and Records Administration's National Personnel Records Center uh, says it, it could be the difference between receiving military benefits and not receiving them at all. It could be the distance or difference between receiving assistance in a homeless shelter for a vet or living out on the street. And what really pulls at my heart are the countless constituent stories that in particular my district team relays to me each and every week as we go through our weekly staff meetings. There is one case I'd like to just quickly call to the attention of those who are here, and we'll just, for lack of a better term, say that this is Andrew's story. Andrew has multiple sclerosis. He contacted our office in February of 2020, filed his disability claim in 2019, three years prior, and received a favorable decision in 2021, and yet the Social Security Administration would not release his benefits. So my district staff and myself got involved. We were able to work with the agency and to finally, 
after all that time, secure Andrew the benefits that he not only desperately needed, but that he was entitled to. But that process extended nearly a year after he had already received a favorable decision from the agency. In the end, the Social Security Administration provided him with $86,000 in retroactive benefits that he was owed. And I would ask uh, Mr. Chairman unanimous consent to submit to the record this CBS article that details Andrew's case and further details how we were able to successfully intervene with the Social Security Without Administration. Without objection, be entered in the record. Thank you. My office alone, and I'm sure every member up here could give you a set of stories about what they've been receiving on the ground with real people every day who are reaching out. My office alone has closed 544 Social Security Administration cases and 683 passport cases since July of last year. And that demonstrates uh, not just the service, but it demonstrates, I think, a tremendous need on behalf of our constituents for federal agency service and for the diligence of federal employees. Uh, one of those employees I have come to appreciate because of the way she has helped intervene in matters like that, and that's Mrs. Lauren Hughes, who serves as a public affairs specialist and is a phenomenal asset to the Social Security Administration and to the congressional offices in that region. And so I could go on and on, but suffice it to say that that's why Democrats and Republicans have set aside party differences and did so several years back to pass the Modernizing Government Technology Act of 2017 to authorize the Technology Modernization Fund and secured nearly $1 billion in investment into the fund. But the issues here are more than just funding and more than just staffing. The issue really becomes vision. Do we have the vision as a government to be able to empower all of our agencies to carry out their task and their missions with respect to constituent services and with respect to being able to make sure that what they are set up to deliver, they do deliver. Uh, I've got a lot of faith in agencies. I do know that uh, sometimes it may be a little unwarranted, particularly if there's an agency that's deliberately not doing what they should. But by and large, I uh, really believe that we've got to find a way to empower our federal agencies, to encourage them, to hold them accountable, and then to be able to measure progress at some point in time. So, Mr. Chairman, there's certainly more work that can be done, uh, and I believe that much of that work will take place in this very subcommittee. Again, I want to commend you for convening us today. I look forward to hearing the facts, strategizing further action needed at the congressional level, and hopefully at the end of the day making a real and lasting difference. I yield back.